Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai, hai rimai, ko Karis Halliday, aho. It's great to have you here today for our Accounting Need to Know webinar for for-profit entities. We hold these every six months or so, and it's to give you a sense of what's new and upcoming in the accounting standards space. I'm joined today by Carly Berry, who's a project manager in our accounting team, uh, and together we'll take you through this update. And we're also joined by Jamie Cattell, another project manager in our accounting team, and he's going to be helping answering any of your questions live as we go. At the XRB, we're responsible for developing and issuing accounting assurance and climate-related disclosure standards. Today, we're focusing on the accounting side of things for for-profit entities. Over the next 50 minutes, Carly and I will take you through the topics listed on this slide, and then we'll save 10 minutes for questions at the end. But please do feel free to add your questions to the Q&A function at any time. A few housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, we will be making these slides available to you after the webinar, as well as a replay. And in some slides, we've added links so that you can easily access additional information. Please be aware that the views presented today are the personal views of myself and Carly and do not necessarily represent those of the XRB. So we're starting with recently issued amendments to standards. We've got four issued by the XRB and one issued just last week by the IASB, which has not yet been issued by us. So the first one of these is disclosure of fees for audit firm services. These changes address concerns about the quality and consistency of disclosures an entity provides about fees paid to its audit or review firm for different types of services. Tier 1 entities are required to disclose the fees incurred for services re received from its audit or review firm and a description of each service using specified categories which distinguish between audit or review of the financial statements and then other non-audit and non-review services such as taxation and other services. Tier 2 entities have reduced disclosure requirements and are required to disclose the total fee for the audit or review of the financial statements, and then the total fees for any other services, together with a general description of those services. These amendments are mandatory for reporting periods beginning on or after 1st of Jan 2024. And if you'd like more detail on this topic, you can check out our recent webinar, which is linked on the slide. So next up is supplier finance arrangements. So these arrangements provide an entity with extended payment terms or the entity suppliers with early payment terms compared to the related payment due date. These amendments are intended to enhance transparency of an entity's supplier finance arrangements. They include new disclosures, such as requiring an entity to disclose the terms and conditions of its supplier finance arrangements and the carrying amounts and associated line items of the financial liabilities that are part of a supplier finance arrangement. It's mandatory for reporting periods beginning on or after 1st of Jan 2024. We are currently consulting on providing reduced disclosure regime concessions for all of the new disclosures for Tier 2 entities. So if this impacts you, we'd love your feedback and you can do that by visiting our consultation page. So now we're on to talking about the amendments to NZIS 12 income taxes for the International Tax Reform Pillar 2 model rules. So for context, the Pillar 2 model rules were published by the OECD and they include tax law that implements a domestic minimum top-up tax as described in those rules. So the accounting amendments introduce a temporary mandatory exception to recognising deferred tax related to Pillar 2 income taxes and then a requirement to disclose that the exception has been applied. So this part of the amendments was mandatory for periods ending on or after 10th of August this year and that's the date that the amending standard took effect. So in other words, if you're preparing financial statements for periods ending from now onwards, you can't recognise deferred taxes related to Pillar 2. The amendments also introduce specific disclosure requirements for those entities exposed to Pillar 2 taxes. 
if this part of the amendment is mandatory for reporting periods beginning on or after 1st of June 2023. So Carly is now going to take us through the amendments affecting non-current liabilities with covenants. Thank you, Karis, and good morning, everyone. So the next new amending standard is non-current liabilities with covenants, which amends NZIS 1 presentation of financial statements. This amending standard clarifies how covenants that a company must comply with within 12 months after the reporting period affect the classification of a liability as current or non-current. Specifically, the amending standard clarifies that only covenants that a company is required to comply with on or before the reporting date affect the classification of a liability as current or non-current. So for example, a covenant that is based on a company's financial position at the end of the reporting period would affect classification, even if compliance is only tested after the reporting date. In contrast, a covenant that is based on a company's financial position six months after the end of the reporting period would not affect classification at the reporting date. However, in this situation, if the company classifies the related liability as non-current, it would need to disclose information in the notes that would allow readers to understand the risk that this liability could become repayable within 12 months after the reporting period. So such disclosure would include the nature of the covenants, when the company must comply with them, as well as the carrying amount of the related liabilities. Also, if necessary, there should be disclosure of facts and circumstances that indicate problems with compliance such as the fact that the company would not have complied with the covenants if assessed based on the company's circumstances at the end of the reporting period, or if the company had acted to avoid or mitigate a potential breach. So this timeline sets out when non-current liabilities with covenants was first issued in New Zealand, when it takes effect for legal purposes, and when it becomes mandatory to apply. The timeline also indicates when you can apply this amending standard early. But before I discuss the timeline in more detail, I do want to clarify the relationship between non-current liabilities with covenants, which I will now refer to as the 2023 amending standard, and the amending standard classification of liabilities as current or non-current, which will be referred to as the 2020 amending standard. So the ISB issued the 2023 amending standard this year, or last year, to respond to stakeholder concerns about the 2020 amending standard. And therefore the two amending standards should be applied together. So going back to the timeline, the mandatory date for the 2023 amending standard is 1st of January, 2024, which means that you must apply for periods beginning on or after this date. However, if your reporting period ends between 22nd of June and 31st of December this year, you may apply the 2023 amending standard for this period, but you would also need to apply the 2020 amending standard at the same time. If you had early adopted the 2020 amending standard before this new amending standard was issued this year, you may be wondering whether you need to apply this new amending standard now, and the answer to that is no. However, if you were looking to apply the 2023 <laughs> sorry, the 2020 amending standard for a period ending after 22nd of June this year, then you would need to apply the 2023 amending standard at the same time. So the effect of this is to ensure that companies that early adopted the 2020 amending standard in a previous period do not have to reverse their accounting until they are required to apply the new amending standard. But those companies that want to early adopt the 2020 amending standard now must apply the two standards together. And finally, please note that the mandatory date for the 2020 amending standard, as well as this new amending standard, is 1st of January 2024. Thanks, Kelly. It does sound pretty confusing, doesn't it? There are a lot of dates. Uh, I guess the yes. main takeaway is if you haven't already adopted um, and you're not trying to do anything in advance of the mandatory dates, the main thing you need to worry about is in 2024, that is when you would be required to adopt both of these together. That's right. Yes. But please let us know if you want to early adopt or if you're confused about anything because um, there are quite a lot of dates. So I appreciate that. I will now move on to standards recently issued by the ISB, of which there is only one. 
This amending standard, lack of exchangeability, was issued last week and amends IS-21, the effects of changes in foreign exchange rates. So a currency may lack exchangeability under certain circumstances, such as when a government imposes controls on capital imports and exports, or when it provides an official exchange rate but limits the volume of foreign currency transactions that can be undertaken at that rate. And so consequently, market participants are unable to buy and sell currency to meet their needs at the official exchange rate and turn instead to unofficial parallel markets. This new amending standard adds requirements for a company to determine whether a currency is exchangeable into another currency and the exchange rate to use when it is not. The amending standard also requires the company to disclose information that enables users to understand how the currency not being exchangeable affects or is expected to affect financial performance, financial position, and cash flows. So a few jurisdictions would be affected by this, but it can have a significant accounting impact for those companies affected. So the amending standard has a mandatory date of 1st of January, 2025. And please note that as Karis mentioned earlier, as the ISB has only recently issued this amending standard, the NZASB has not yet approved it, but will consider the standard for approval in due course in accordance with our due process. So I'll now move on to the next section of this webinar, which discusses the activities of the IFRS Interpretations Committee. Before getting into this section, it is worth reminding you what the purpose of the committee is. So one of the key functions of the committee is to respond to questions about the application of IFRS accounting standards to support consistent application around the world. The committee publishes agenda decisions when it decides that a standard setting project should not be added to its work plan. Now, these agenda decisions do not add or change requirements in IFRS, but they often include explanatory material that may provide new information on how to apply a standard for a specific transaction or fact pattern. Therefore, enable, to be able to assert compliance with the IFRS accounting standards, companies are expected to change their accounting policies to the extent that their accounting differs from that described in the agenda decision. Now, moving on to tentative agenda decisions. So this slide sets out three matters for which the committee has recently issued tentative agenda decisions. Now for all these matters, the committee decided that no standard setting projects will be added to the work plan. However, I will briefly touch on each of the fact patterns so that you can decide if they're relevant to you. The links on the slide will take you to the ISB's website if you would like more detail. So the first matter concerns a guarantee written over a derivative contract, which reimburses the holder for the actual loss incurred up to the closeout amount in the event of a default by the other party. The closeout amount is determined based on evaluation of the remaining contractual cash flows of the derivative prior to default. And the request asks whether in applying IFRS 9 financial instruments, this guarantee is a financial guarantee contract or a derivative. The committee noted that this matter is not widespread and where it does arise, the amounts involved are not material. So the next matter concerns two fact patterns, a situation where a company provides its employee with a house that the employer owns and a situation where a company provides its employee with a loan to buy a house. The request asks how a company accounts for these arrangements. The committee noted for this one as well, that this matter is not widespread and where it does arise, the amounts involved are not material. And the final matter shown here concerns a situation where a parent company merges with the subsidiary, resulting in the subsidiary's business becoming part of the parent company. The request asks how the com parent company should account for the merger transaction in its separate financial statements. The committee noted that there is little if any, diversity in accounting for the merger transactions. They noted that parent companies generally recognize the subsidiary's assets and liabilities at the previous carrying amounts and do not apply the requirements of IFRS 3. I'll now move on to another recent tentative agenda decision, which concerns premiums receivable from an intermediary. So in this request received by the committee, an intermediary acts as a link between an insurer and a policyholder to arrange an insurance contract between them. 
The policyholder has paid the premiums in cash to the intermediary, but the insurer has not yet received the premiums in cash from the intermediary. The agreement between the insurer and the intermediary allows the intermediary to collect the premiums to the insurer at a later date. When the policyholder pays the premiums to the intermediary, the policyholder discharged its obligations under the insurance contract, and the insurer is obliged to provide insurance contract services to the policyholder. If the intermediary fails to pay the premiums to the insurer, the insurer does not have the right to recover the premiums from the policyholder, nor can it cancel the insurance contract. So this request asks whether premiums receivable from the intermediary are future cash flows within the boundary of an insurance contract and included in the measurement of the group of insurance contracts supplying IFRS 17 insurance contracts, or are a separate financial asset applying IFRS 9. So the committee observed that IFRS 17 is a starting point for the insurer to consider how to account for its right to receive premiums under an insurance contract. However, the committee noted that IFRS 17 is silent on whether future cash flows within the boundary of an insurance contract are removed from the measurement of a group of insurance contracts only when these cash flows are recovered or settled in cash. In the request, the insurer has not recovered the premiums in cash. Therefore, in accounting for premiums receivable from an intermediary, when payment by the policyholder discharges the policyholder's obligation under the insurance contract, an insurer can account for the premiums under IFRS 9 or IFRS 17. So the committee considered whether to add a standard setting project on the interaction between IFRS 9 and 17 to its work plan. However, any such project would involve assessing whether changes to the standards would have unintended consequences. This assessment would also take considerable time and effort to complete because it would include, among other steps, analyzing a broad range of contracts. The committee did observe that applying either IFRS 9 or 17 when accounting for premiums paid by a policyholder and receivable from an intermediary would provide users with useful information based on the requirements in either of these standards. And so therefore the committee concluded that a project would not result in an improvement in financial reporting that would be sufficient to outweigh the costs. And so did not decide to add a standard setting project to its work plan. If you would like further detail on this tentative agenda decision, please use the link on the slide. And now I shall hand back to Karis. Thank you. Thanks, Carly. So since I last need to know, the Interpretations Committee has referred two matters to the ISB for narrow scope standard setting. The first relates to power purchase agreements, and I'm going to go over these in more detail on the next slides. And then the other one relates to the accounting applied by a hyperinflationary parent when it consolidates a non-hyperinflationary subsidiary. So the Interpretations Committee agreed that standard setting is required to eliminate, eliminate diversity as to whether the parent does or does not restate the subsidiary's results and financial position in terms of the measuring unit current at the end of the reporting period. So if that is relevant to you, you might like to read up on it further. So now we're going to go into power purchase agreements. But before we go into the specifics of the submission that IFRIC received, let's first go through what we're talking about when we say power purchase agreements. So a power purchase agreement is a long-term contract between an electricity generator and a customer. And during the life of the contract, the customer buys energy at a pre-negotiated price. They're often described as either being a physical power purchase agreement or a virtual power purchase agreement. And this depends on the structure of the electricity market, which can be described as either being net pool or gross pool. Because these contracts can be quite complicated, I am going to generalize here about what you typically see in these markets and contracts. But as they continue to evolve, I'm sure many variations are possible beyond what we'll talk about today. So in a net pool electricity market, the energy seller, so the generator, contracts directly with electricity buyers for the volume of electricity to be delivered. So when electricity is produced, the electricity generator transfers the electricity via the grid and credits the customer's account with the volume delivered. In New Zealand, the majority of electricity generated, although there are some exceptions such as small scale solar, 
it must in the first instance be sold to the wholesale market and can't be sold directly to an electricity retailer or consumer. So that's why our wholesale market is often referred to as being gross pool. So this means that a power purchase agreement in New Zealand typically does not involve the sale of physical electricity, but it's a financial agreement to make settlements based on the difference between an agreed price and the associated spot price. So that's why power purchase agreements in New Zealand are often referred to as being virtual power purchase agreements. So with that context, the submission if it received, I will jump to the next slide, uh, related to applying the own use exception in IFRS 9 to power purchase agreements, specifically related to purchasing energy from renewable sources. So according to the submission, although the own use requirements in IFRS 9 work well in markets with stable supply conditions, the changing electricity market conditions give rise to application challenges and could result in accounting outcomes that do not faithfully represent the economic substance of such contracts. So as a reminder, the own use exception in IFRS 9 allows some contracts to buy or sell non-financial items, such as electricity or other commodities like grain, to be excluded from the scope of financial instruments accounting. But to apply, the contract must be entered into and held for the purpose of receiving or delivering that non-financial item in accordance with the entity's expected purchase, sale or usage requirements, not for trading or speculation. So the submission raised three separate fact patterns. And I'm not going to go into those in detail because there's a lot in there. But I think a good way to think about them is as a set of examples that point out some challenges unique to power purchase agreements, primarily because we can't currently store electricity very well. So the first example asks if or when you can apply the own use exception when the entity's demand is variable, such as when the entity doesn't operate its production facilities outside of business hours. Example two, asks if you can continue applying the own use exception when an entity's demand unexpectedly decreases and its settlement patterns then change on an ongoing basis. An example three asks if you can apply the own use exception when the supply is variable, so you haven't contracted into fixed amounts. The Interpretations Committee had a really robust discussion on this issue and it highlighted the complexities involved. Ultimately, they referred the matter to the International Accounting Standards Board with a recommendation that the ISB consider narrow scope standard setting. They acknowledged that the standard is unclear and recommended that the ISB consider if it can be improved in the following areas. So how the market structure affects the entity's own usage requirements, especially when the energy cannot be stored and must be consumed immediately how to evaluate the entity's expected usage requirements over time when the delivery of energy is continuous and variable, and then how to interpret transactions in the spot market after delivery, whether they indicate a trading or hedging purpose or really are a storage mechanism. So then at its meeting in July, in response to the recommendation from the Interpretations Committee, the International Accounting Standards Board tentatively decided to add a project to its work plan to research whether narrow scope amendments could be made to IFRS 9 to better reflect how financial statements are affected by power purchase agreements in which the underlying non-financial item can't be stored economically and is required to either be consumed or sold within a short time as determined by the market structure in which the item is bought and sold. They decided that the ISB's research will focus on applying the own use exception in IFRS 9 to physical power purchase agreements and applying the hedge accounting requirements in IFRS 9 using a virtual power purchase agreement as the hedging instrument. Their intention is to kick this research off right away and we'll be monitoring their progress. We're also looking to understand whether there are both physical and virtual power purchase agreements in place in New Zealand and their prevalence materiality in current accounting. 
So if this is something you'd like to talk to us about and it affects you, please do get in touch. To give us a rough initial idea of how common these are in New Zealand, please do let us know in this polling question whether you're involved with power to purchase agreements. So I'll just get the poll to go live. Thanks for that. Lots of answers coming through, lots of no's, um, but a few with yeses and not sure's. Share those results. So thank you. That's good context for us. Um, and we will be doing more research um, and outreach on this topic over the coming months. So switching gears now to the post-implementation review, which is currently underway on IFRS 15, revenue from contracts with customers. So I'm sure many of you well remember implementing IFRS 15, and now that it's been in place for a few years, the ISB is checking whether it is working as intended. So if you have any feedback on the standard, now is the time to let us know so that we can make sure that the ISB is made aware of the New Zealand perspective. From our outreach so far, uh, we've been hearing that principal versus agent remains a, an area where there can be challenges, um, as well as the interaction between IFRS 15 and other standards that sit on its borders. So I would like to take this chance to gauge how you're finding IFRS 15 at a really high level. So we will do a couple more polling questions um, on this topic. So the first one is, oh, it's not wanting to work for me. Bear with me, if the technology will play along. So hopefully you should be able to see the second polling question now, um, which is what's your overall view of IFRS 15? Is it working well? Um, room for some improvements? Not working for you? Just give you another moment. Looks like there's lots of answers coming through. All right, I'll share those so you can see. So looks like the majority are sitting in. It's generally working well, but there is room for improvement. And that, um, that's reflective of what we've been hearing so far in our other outreach as well. So thank you. And then the, the next question. So for those who think that there's room for some improvement or room for lots of improvements, um, which area are you experiencing the greatest application challenges? Give you a couple of minutes here because there's a, a few options to read through. Looks like we're slowing down. So I'll share these. So it's quite interesting. It's quite split across all the topics. And I guess that really is reflective of how facts and circumstances specific IFRS 15 is. So it really depends on the nature of your revenue and entity type as to where you'll be experiencing challenges. Okay, so if you do have feedback for us, uh, there's a few ways you can get in touch. The first is to go to our consultation page linked on the slide 
You can submit feedback there. You can see the full ISB consultation document as well. Um, or if you are a preparer of financial statements and you'd like to give us feedback, you could join one of our round tables. So we're splitting these up by entities who uh, provide goods versus those who provide services. And the times and dates are listed on the slides. Please email us at accounting at xrb.govt.nz if you would like to join one of those. Uh, and otherwise, um, yeah, email in any informal comments as well. Thank you. So back to you, Carly, for a heads up on what is upcoming. Thanks, Karis. So the final section of this webinar looks at those consultations and standards on the horizon. In other words, what we can expect from the ISB within the next six months or so. This slide sets out upcoming ISB consultations, and I'll provide some brief comments for each. So the first one is an exposure draft due in September this year, so next month, setting out proposed amendments to a number of standards as part of the ISB's annual improvement cycle. So just to give some context, for an amendment to be included in the annual improvement cycle, it would need to be limited to one of the following circumstances. So either clarifying the wording in a standard, which involves either replacing unclear wording in an existing standard, or providing requirements where an absence of requirements is causing concern, or correcting relatively minor unintended consequences, oversights or conflicts between existing requirements. The next consultation is also an exposure draft due in the final quarter of this year and relating to the ISB's financial instruments with characteristics of equity project. This project seeks to address common accounting challenges that arise in practice when applying IS32 financial instruments presentation, such as when classifying a complex financial instrument as a financial liability or equity instrument. These challenges can arise because IS32 does not always provide a clear rationale for its classification requirements. So the ISB is seeking to clarify some of the underlying principles in this standard, as well as add some application guidance. The ISB is also intending to further develop some presentation and disclosure requirements to provide more information about a financial instrument's effect on the issuer's financial position and performance. The final consultation listed here is an exposure draft setting out proposals relating to the ISB's project on business combinations, disclosures, goodwill, and impairment. The exposure draft is expected in the first half of 2024. The ISB's focus for this project is on disclosure requirements about business combinations and changes to the impairment tests of cash generating units containing goodwill and IS36 impairment of assets. As a result, the ISB hopes to improve the information that companies disclose about business combinations, as well as improve the effectiveness of the impairment test and simplify its application. The links on these slides on this slide will take you to the ISB's website, where you can find out some more detail on these consultations. So this slide sets out two significant new IFRS accounting standards with an expected issue date to sometime within the first half of next year. The first one, Subsidiaries Without Public Accountability, Disclosures, sets out disclosure requirements that an eligible subsidiary, as described in the standard, may apply when preparing its financial statements. The effect of this is that an eligible subsidiary will apply the same recognition and measurement requirements as full IFRS, but is permitted to comply with reduced disclosures. So this is similar in concept to current tier two for profit reporting requirements. The next new IFRS accounting standard is an output of the ISB's primary financial statements project and sets out presentation and disclosure requirements. So this is a significant development in IFRS accounting standards and will affect all tier one and tier two for profit entities. Therefore, we'll take a closer look at this new standard over the next couple of slides to give you a heads up on what's coming. So the ISP's objective with their primary financial statements project is to improve how information is communicated in the financial statements with the focus on information in the statement of profit or loss. The new standard will replace IS1 and has an expected mandatory date of 1st of January, 2027. 
So please note that the ISB is currently taking the standard through its balloting process, and therefore it is not yet finalized. The next slide will give you a high level overview of some of the key features of this new standard based on the ISB's decisions to date, but I'll not go into too much detail at this stage. Once the standard is issued, we will run more in-depth information sessions. But as I said previously, this is just to give you a heads up. There are three key features that the new standard is expected to introduce. And I will start with categories and new defined subtotals. So the ISB decided to develop new requirements for the structure of the statement of profit or loss to improve comparability and understandability of the information presented in the statement. And so therefore there are now five categories in the statement of profit or loss, operating, investing, financing, income tax and discontinued operations. To determine which income and expenses should go into which category, you will be required to first determine whether you have one or both of what the standard refers to as a specified main business activity. And these are investing in assets or providing financing to customers. The standard will provide guidance on how to make this determination. And making this determination is important because this will, in some cases, affect how you classify certain income and expenses in the statement of profit or loss. So on a high level, each category will comprise the following income and expenses. So for the operating category, category, this is the default category and comprises all income and expenses that are not classified in one of the other categories. A new mandatory subtotal called operating profit comprises all income and expenses classified in the operating category. For the investing category, this will include income and expenses from assets that generate a return individually and largely independently of the company's other resources. So an example of this could be rental income from an investment property. Certain other income and expenses relating to investments such as investments in associates and joint ventures would also go into the investing category. The second new mandatory subtotal, which is profit before financing and income tax, comprises operating profit or loss and all income and expenses classified in the investing category. Now moving on to the financing category. So this will include income and expenses relating to the raising of finance, such as interest expense on a loan or debt restructuring expenses. It will also include certain other interest income and expense, such as interest expense on lease liabilities applying IFRS 16 leases. If a company has one of the specified main business activities I mentioned earlier, this will affect the classification of certain income and expenses. It may also affect the subtotals presented in the statement of profit or loss. So for example, the ISB has decided to allow an accounting policy choice to classify in the operating category all income and expenses from liabilities that arise from transactions involving only the raising of finance. But only a company that provides financing to customers as a main business activity has this policy choice. So for a company that makes this choice, the ISB decided that it would be misleading to allow the company to use a subtotal called profit before financing and income tax. So it is not permitted to use this particular subtotal, but it may, however, present another subtotal if it decides that it is necessary. Please note that the statement of profit or loss will not contain headings for the categories. These categories are merely a way for the company to structure the information in its statement of profit or loss in an understandable way that will allow for improved comparison across companies. So the next key feature I'll discuss concerns management performance measures or MPMs for short. So what are MPMs? So they are defined as subtotals of income and expense not specified by IFRS accounting standards that are used in public communications outside of financial statements and provide management's view on an aspect of an entity's financial performance. So what does this mean exactly? Let's break it down. Firstly, the MPM must be a subtotal of income and expenses. Therefore, measures such as adjusted revenue would not be an MPM because this is a subtotal of income only. 
Also, a measure such as free cash flow would also not be an NPM because this is not a subtotal of income or expense or an, ex an expense. Next, a subtotal specified by an IFRS accounting standard is not an NPM. So an example of this is operating profit. And this is important to note because there will be disclosures that you'll need to make for all your NPMs. The NPM must not be used in public communication. Oh, sorry, the NPM must be used in public communications outside of financial statements. So an example of this would be an investor presentation. Public communications for the purposes of the standard will specifically exclude social media posts, oral communications, as well as transcripts of oral communications. And finally, the NPM provides management's view on an aspect of, an, of a company's financial performance. Management's use of a subtotal to assess or monitor internally an aspect of the company's financial performance demonstrates that the subtotal communicates management's view. As I mentioned previously, the standard will require specific disclosures to be made in a single note for NPMs, and these disclosures will include a reconciliation between the NPM and the most directly comparable IFRS subtotal or total including the income tax effect and the effect um, on non-controlling interests for each item disclosed in the reconciliation. And the final key feature I will focus on is aggregation and disaggregation principles for presentation and disclosure of information in financial statements. So in summary, a company will classify and aggregate items on the basis of shared characteristics and disaggregate items on the basis of characteristics that are not shared. Aggregation and disaggregation must not obscure financial material information or reduce the understandability of the information presented or disclosed. A company must also keep in mind the role of the primary financial statements and the role of the notes when aggregating and disaggregating items. And the standard will include further guidance on what these roles are. Line items in the financial statements must be described in a way that faithfully represents the characteristics of the item. So when it comes to use of the term other to describe an item, such as other income, a company may only use this label if it can find no more informative label. Application guidance will be included in the standard to assist companies with determining a more informative label. So with respect to the aggregation of operating expenses, companies will be allowed to use a mixed presentation, for example, a mix of nature and function method. Information about operating expenses by nature must be disclosed in a single note when a company uses a function method to present its operating expenses. Specifically, a company must disclose amounts of depreciation, amortization, employee benefits, and payment and write downs of inventories included in each function line item in the statement of profit or loss. So this overview of the new standard is fairly high level, and there is much more detail to grasp, including some limited changes to requirements in I7, Statement of Cash Flows. But as I mentioned before, more detailed information sessions will be provided once a new standard is issued. Thank you. Thanks, Carly. Uh, so now we've got time for questions, and I can see there are some coming through. Um, few on that last topic on primary financial statements. So while that's fresh in everyone's minds, I think we'll start with some of those ones. So Carly, uh, the new categories that you mentioned, are those meant to align with categories in the cash flow statement? No, not necessarily. So it wasn't the ISB specific intention to align these two. So for example, the investing category in the statement of cash flows includes investments in operating assets such as PP&E. However, in the statement of um, profit or loss, a company would classify income and expenses relating to operating assets in its operating category. So at the, at the exposure draft stage, there were some respondents who suggested using different labels just to avoid confusion, but the ISB did note that the new presentation and disclosure standard won't require actual headings to be included in the statement of profit or loss for these categories. So that should minimize some confusion there. 
Um, one other thing I just want to note is that the ISB did consider aligning the financing category with the financing activities category in the statement of cash flows, but decided not to go ahead with doing that because it would involve updating the definition of financing activities in the cash flow standard, and that would have broadened the scope of the project. So they decided to take another approach. Thank you. Uh, and one on management performance measures. Mm -hmm. So um, if I'm a company and I have one stakeholder requesting a particular measure, and it's something that I then put out there, but it's not how I view the business as management, is that something that then falls under management performance measures? No, not necessarily. So remember the MPM definition requires among other things, that's, that the subtotal represents management's view of an aspect of a company's financial performance. However, the standard will include a presumption that a subtotal of income and expenses that a company uses in its public communications outside of financial statements will communicate management's view of that aspect of financial performance. Therefore, MPM disclosures would need to be made if other parts of the definition are met. But the ISB will allow a company to rebut this presumption if it has reasonable and supportable information that the subtotal does not communicate management's view and the subtotal is used in public communications for a reason other than communicating management's view. So <clears throat> as an example, a reason could be that law or regulation requires a communication to be made or an external party requested it. But just note that if management does use the subtotal to assess or monitor internally the company's financial performance, then this would demonstrate that the subtotal communicates management's view. So therefore, the subtotal could still be a management performance measure, even if it is only publicly communicated by reason of law, if, um, if it actually does use this measure internally. So that's just something to note. So specific facts and circumstances will determine that and the guidance or well, the standard will provide more guidance on this point. So help. Thanks, Carly. Uh, and then there's one more on uh, primary financials and then we're going to jump up to one on non-current liabilities. Um, so this last one here is about the disaggregation requirements. Uh, will that result in system changes and has the ISB commented or thought about that? So there may, may be some changes depending on, on your company and your systems that you have. The ISB definitely did take into account prepare concerns when it came to disaggregating operating expenses. Um, there may be some of you who recall from the exposure draft stage that the um, ISB wanted a analysis of total operating expenses by nature in a single note. But preparers did indicate that that would be quite complex and costly to generate and would result in some quite fundamental system changes. So they did step back from that and are now only requiring certain specified expenses to be disclosed by nature. Um, let me think. Um, yes. So in total, yes, the ISB did consider and did have more onerous requirements, but to step that back. So hopefully that will help companies make this disclosure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, they're really trying to strike that right balance of, of what users have told them they want to see versus what preparers have said is, is doable. Yes. So a question here um, on how does the classification of non-current liabilities with covenants impact going concern accounting? So I might have the first got this one, Carly, and then if you want to jump in as well, feel free. Um, so I would say this is just one aspect which management's going to be considering when they're making their going concern assessment. So as we know, when you're thinking about going concern, it's whether management intends to liquidate the entity or cease trading or has no realistic alternative to do so. Your, your non-current liabilities with covenants, so what this amendment is doing is it's telling you to think about those covenants that an entity must comply with 
on or before the reporting period. And so that's affecting your classification. But then you are also doing uh, disclosures so that users can understand the risk that non-current liabilities with covenants could become re repayable within 12 months. And so if that is something that you've got significant doubt over or it's a material un uncertainty, that may impact your going concern assessment, but that would just be one factor you'd be taking into account. Anything you'd like to add, Carly? No, that's about, about right. So as you say, there would be disclosures if there is any... Um, any facts or circumstances that could indicate that you won't be complying with covenants that are only payable in the next after 12 months then you need to make these disclosures so um, that would encourage companies to think about their going concern as well cool. uh, and then a question on pillar two tax so why has this exception um, the deferred tax exception been put in place so the reason for that is the ISB was responding to stakeholder concerns about uh, the uncertainty over the accounting for deferred taxes arising from the rules. So stakeholders highlighted that the top-up tax differs from income taxes, um, traditional income taxes, because you're only going to have to pay it if your income tax is insufficient, so you're, you're bumping up to that minimum amount. And so... IS-12 wasn't designed for that, it didn't have that in mind. So are you in the scope and how do you deal with that level of uncertainty when you're coming up with deferred tax? And so the ISB has responded quite quickly to these concerns by putting in this temporary exception and it will allow time for entity for jurisdictions to implement the rules, for entities to see how those rules are applied and in the meantime, it stops different interpretations of IS-12 developing in practice. Um, okay, looks like we're just about there on questions. Any last, last call for questions? Um, and then the one other thing I'd like to highlight is that we have the chair of the International Accounting Standards Board coming to visit us in November and so we're currently planning a schedule of events. We'll be hosting a live webinar with him while he's here and we'll be giving you plenty of opportunity to send in any questions that you'd like to get in front of Andreas. Look out for more information on that. And so that is the conclusion of today's webinar. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, if you do want to keep up to date with news about accounting standards or other XRB work, please follow us on LinkedIn or you can subscribe to our newsletter. Thanks for coming. Um, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Thank you.